presentation last week. He's been doing all sorts of interesting stuff. Much of it, I guess you would call small scale, kind of something beyond guerrilla research, but somewhere, I don't know, not the classic huge uh, research projects. Is that a fair characterization? Uh, David Kernahan with JISC, uh, who's actually written a lot of interesting things on some of the open frameworks for data, research data, and things like that, among many other uh, issues. And he's also a writer for, is it Wong Hei Chi? Is the answer? Yeah, Wong Hei Chi. Which is kind of very high level policy analysis in the UK. And I, I actually really enjoy reading his pieces, even though I know very little about these white papers he's writing because it's just so cutting and, and, and really great analysis. Um, we have Beck Pitt, who was here uh, earlier this year, talking about the work from the OER Research Hub, which is where she's from, as is Martin Hare, who just spoke. Uh, Rob Farrow is also with the OER Research Hub. And uh, we have Tannis Morgan, and we kind of added her, because after we kind of circulated it, she actually has been leading some interesting research out of her institution on OER research as well. Is that fair? Yeah. So with that, I'm not even going to say who can talk first. I'm just going to try to walk away <laughs> and hope that something emerges. Um, I think we should uh, clarify if you're expecting that we all got together last night, had a few coffees, and we actually planned and wrote out this session. It didn't happen. We were at a jam session at uh, Ron's house. So we <laughs> want to talk about the jam session. We're entirely prepared on that. Uh, this may feel a little unstructured. So what I was wondering is, we've got this uh, weird uh, title that uh, Brian has made up and he's not told us about, which is the state of open research and of research on open, which is one of those titles that could be taken in two directions. We could talk about actual research into open practice, uh, or we could talk about the um, the openness of academic research more generally. Now, I'd imagine that there are people that are, would be interested in both or either or neither of these. So I thought I'd start by taking the temperature of the room so that then we can uh, decide what to focus on. Does this seem fair? <laughs> really? That's a bit over the top, I think. But... Just, just keep talking. Oh, OK, I'll just keep, <laughs> keep talking. Anyway, octopus biology is fascinating. Should we just talk about octopus biology? Uh, right, so um, if you feel you would be more interested in hearing about research on open education, please raise your hand or otherwise indicate. If you would be more interested in hearing about open practices in research more generally, please raise your hands. So it's almost exactly mm. half and half. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> That's why I wrote a generic title. <laughs> yes, indeed. So um, I guess it makes sense to start with a big picture, the macro picture, and then come down to open research as a particular thing, which I've just realized means that I do a little bit of the first bit, which I seem to be doing. So. Is everyone okay with that? I just don't want to be like uh, that guy that talks all the time. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Chris. Okay, so uh, research is uh, an academic process, a set of academic practices that has changed more probably in the last five to ten years than it had in the previous 200. The classical model of research is that uh, you're a scholar, you're employed by an institution as a scholar, you have an office possibly, uh, you have the tools that you need to do your research. Somebody gives you some money to do some research. You say thank you very much, you do the research, you conduct experiments, collect data, you write that up as a research paper that you put in a peer-reviewed journal. Uh, the journal sends it to a couple of your peers, it's uh, reviewed anonymously, and the, the entire visible output of your research is the paper or papers that you've written. Academic papers started, it's actually a UK invention, back in 1700 with the Royal Society. It was, I mean, rather than just announcing something, I have uh, discovered that there are more than four elements, that there's no such 
thing of the ether, that kind of thing. It was actually expected that you would use a scientific uh, uh, method. You would collect or analyze data. You would document the way you collected the data and the way that you analyzed the data in the methodology section and then draw conclusions uh, based on that. The idea being other um, academics could then uh, read your paper and uh, critique it, critique your methodology, critique your conclusions, etc. This is all kind of very simplified history. So if anybody does specialize in this stuff or is Rob Farrow, I'm sorry. Um, what started to happen at that point is that the academic paper became the uh, unit of measurement uh, for how uh, uh, good an academic you were. If you published more papers, if you published papers that were cited more often, if you published papers that were in more prestigious journals, that made you a better academic. It meant that you got uh, paid more, it meant that you got a bigger office, it uh, meant that you got a professorial chair like Martins. It uh, meant that, I mean, you were a, a big academic deal. Uh, so, uh, funding also followed this. If you were, were publishing lots of papers in good journals, you got uh, more money either for more research projects or actually uh, via institutional support. This whole system, as you probably spotted, had the intended consequence that it uh, massively and exponentially increased the volume of research that is published. It is uh, now no longer possible in somebody like uh, Robert Hooke's uh, day to actually uh, read all of the academic literature in a subject, even in micro when even in open education, it's not possible. It's not physically or literally possible to sit down and read everything. So clearly something needed to change. Uh, academic journals at this point became um, a massive business that were uh, bought up from learned societies by big publishing companies, started to charge academic libraries. I know there's a, a lot of librarians in the room, lots and lots of money to subscribe to them. And because if somebody published a paper in a journal, they immediately saw, ah, oh, the library should subscribe to this. Uh, the budgets went up, and it ended up that actually nobody uh, read any of the papers. A statistic that I've, that, that, that I've st seen cited a lot, I can't recall the source, the average academic paper is read by uh, 0.8 people, and that includes the person that actually wrote the paper. <laughs> <laughs> so we've got a big problem here. There's amazing science, amazing research being done, uh, nobody can read it, uh, nobody's got time to read it, if they want to read it they might not have access to it, and if they uh, do uh, read it, it's uh, just the paper, they might not get a complete sense of the research behind it. This all started to change at the turn of the millennium. Uh, it started in medical sciences and physical sciences, some uh, stuff like archive. Um, and other open platforms. Uh, people would share their research uh, before it was published. Um, if you're submitting a paper through the publication system, you get what's called um, a final version. I can't remember the vocabulary. That's pre-printed. <laughs> Author accepted version, that's right. Which means it's not being published yet. It's the last version you own. So because uh, you own that, uh, you can share it. There's also the link concept of the preprint, which after you published, you normally got a little stack of uh, printouts of your paper you could send to your friends if they asked you. Uh, and that became mm -hmm. electronic as well. Um, so that was the start of open access to research. These days in the UK, every single major research funder mandates that uh, papers are published in the open either via that uh, method of uh, publishing an author accepted version 
or that the actual journals themselves are open for anybody to access. This caused the big publishers that I mentioned earlier to turn around and say, hang on a second, we're not getting paid here, I'll come back to that later. Linked to that, we started to get um, increasing concern about the idea of uh, reproducibility. The point of writing it, an academic paper is to clear get your, uh, your research so somebody else can uh, verify it, they can do the same research and uh, 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 they can use the same methods and the same data and get the same results and that uh, means that you're doing uh, proper science rather than making stuff up. Which is, I think we can all agree, is generally a good thing. Also makes for better quality mm -hmm. science if you validate somebody else's paper and it doesn't show up, you actually write a paper about that yourself. Mm -hmm. But a big barrier to this is uh, with the growth of large data sets, with the uh, growth of uh, customized algorithms and uh, software that's been written specifically to analyze these data sets, it becomes harder. So um, a movement has started to share these data sets, to share these processes, these programs, and although uh, funders uh, aren't yet uh, mandating all of that, they are starting to mandate parts of that in the UK and uh, further afield. Linked to that, you get the ideas of authorship and uh, being able to claim authorship of the paper. There's actually another guy called David Kernahan who uh, publishes papers <laughs> in the built environment. He's actually very good, he's written a lot of books. He's not me. Um, I've not written a lot of books. I've not written any. I don't think. Uh, but um, I need a, some kind of a way to uh, tell us apart, especially as people are, are looking at the uh, volume of papers that have been uh, published. He might, if he's unscrupulous and deviant, he might decide that he wants to claim that he's written one of my papers. And God knows why, but he might. And I'd like, I need to be able to not to do that, so uh, various means of identifying uh, research sources. The most uh, famous, I think, is called ORCID. Mm -hmm. um, it's an identifier for each researcher, so you can follow through every part of the research process. You know exactly who the researcher was, <coughs> who the with you need to be. You've got access to their data, you've got access to their paper and conclusions, you've got access to any tools or software that is needed. And that's just a, a taste of the way that uh, uh, research has changed. I mean, linked to that, you've got the stuff Martin was talking about, about uh, dissemination, about uh, publishing not just in, a, in an open uh, journal, but entirely in, in the open on uh, blogs, on uh, other social media services. You've got the rise of academic uh, journalism. Uh, the idea if you've written a really sexy piece of research, actually normally a piece of research about sex, <laughs> explicitly, because that gets picked up by newspapers and it's like seven out of uh, 10 uh, uh, British people have never seen their partner naked or something like that. And obviously that's not in any sense true as far as I know, but we could probably test this on the panel. Um, <laughs> and we, that's the kind of thing that uh, newspapers uh, take off. You've had the uh, rise of research offices that like to pr promote that kind of thing. The PR teams don't really, that don't actually really understand it. All of that stuff is still getting critiqued. Uh, both by research peers and by um, general members of the uh, public who just think it sounds really stupid and wrong. Um, so you've got but that aspect to the way research is being used as well. Um, so it's become a very complicated way uh, to, um, it's become actually very complicated to actually be an academic. A lot of the old assumptions have uh, shifted and have changed, and the kind of support that we need to give academic researchers now is very, very different to the kind of 
expectations that the people that are training these new academics might have. So there's a big disconnect, and that's uh, one of the big problems academia is uh, facing. Um, so I've talked for a long time, and you've looked at me like I'm mad, which is <laughs> lovely. I think if we can now we take this down to the next level, we start to uh, uh, make this more s specific about uh, open education research, open research into open education, if you will, and we can bring in uh, these three. I'd like to bring in Robert next, because he'll probably tell me that I'm wrong about everything, but I think anybody can dive in at this point. Thank you. Well, um, if anyone else wants to speak, feel free, otherwise I can say something. <laughs> um, I, don't think, I don't think you're wrong, I think that's a really good summary. Um, there's a couple of things I'd maybe add to it. Um, one is, and maybe these are kind of related things, one is the kind of ambivalence towards openness that you get from institutions. Who, on the, you know, to say, take something like um, uh, open access publication. So yeah, we get these, these mandates, you have to be open, you have to publish open access, but at the same time, you get pressure to publish it only in the highest ranked journals. So how are you supposed to square that circle? At the moment, we have a, we have a kind, of a, kind of a fudge. Uh, I mean, one way of doing it would be to say that, well, actually, the, the way we rank journals is wrong, right? Yes, so, yeah, so maybe the ones that are open access, I mean, they're getting cited more, they're getting read more. Why yeah. aren't they the highest ranked ones? And partly that's a strategic thing by the publishers to make sure that they are somehow the guardians of quality even though all of the expert work is done for free by academics in terms of editing and uh, mm. peer review and so on. So there's, there's, you know, there's a mixed message coming from institutions in terms of what constitutes um, good open dissemination around that, I would say. Um, but also, I think, more widely, um, institutions and their relation to openness generally. And to pick up on some of the historical themes that you mentioned, I mean, really, the, the, the idea of the modern university, I mean, leaving aside some of the Renaissance stuff, if you take it as a, as a sort of enlightenment idea that we should have public science, everyone should have an education, we should, have this, we should aspire to this society which is kind of an open scientific community, um, I think that's still a good aspiration. Um, and I would say that that's, that's, that's part of a, a, a longer and, and sort of, if you look at the, the history of academic institutions more generally, They've kind of always had this sort of dialectical thing going on between closed and open. Very, very, if you go right back to the start, you know, like the classical world, you have, um, there's no such thing as a, an open group of scholars. They are purely kind of closed groups who, you know, you only get into it by having someone who takes you on as an apprentice, basically, and, you, have, you know, it's kind of small scholarly communities. Um, and then gradually, you know, you've got these different, these, these, I suppose a lot of it's about technology and, and technology making it possible to share ideas more widely. Printing press is a good example. The internet's another one. Um, you get this, this force sort of um, against those kind of constraints and against the closeness of those communities. Where, and it should be an outward-facing thing, right? It should be something that um, we, we validate ideas and, 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 and findings by putting them out to people to, to test it. And that's why you're doing it in the first place. Um, so, so what are the institutions for? Thinking about these PR um, offices, who you know they've got their own agenda. Well, what is it? You know, is it just does it just kind of come down to money and, and admissions and that kind of thing? Um, and the only thing I was going to add to what you, you said was um, uh, um, I've forgotten it. It'll come back to me. <laughs> It'll be good when it comes. <laughs> it's worth the wait. Yeah, it might be tomorrow. I think that's all very good as well. And I think, uh, from my experience, of four or five UK universities now, I think education research um, and open education research is in itself problematic. I don't know about most people, but we don't sit within education departments. So I'm in within the science department that couldn't give a stuff. Um, about what I'm doing, and I don't get the funding and the resources and the support to to build that. So I think that's another problem that open education and education or researchers face. It's like where do you sit within your organisation, and, uh, and how does that work? I mean, you're not you're not valued in the same way. I think uh, probably going off a, a tangent now. I think there's some really interesting 
change. I think the other big problem with research is the element of, of bias. And there's some amazing um, papers in, in Nature recently looking at the whole sort of research culture and how we approach things. This whole element of you know, 99% of what we publish are only our positive results. Mm. We tried to talk about this at the uh, open ed last week, but we need to start talking about, and Martin said, some of the bad stuff as well. And some journals now actually have sort of little columns of publish your negative data, get some negative stuff out there. You know, because Laura Ramsey said it should be 50 50. That's the other problem that we have is not much research is actually published or even read. And actually, mm -hmm. what is out there is just actually quite, quite biased. Of, what's going on within the field to have something like get below the tip of the iceberg. Mm -hmm. um, the other problem, but I think uh, with some of the open approaches now, that's quite interesting where you've got more open peer review processes. People are publishing and sharing protocols openly before they're actually doing the research and part of the Cochrane organisation. If systematic reviews and we'll get our, pub, our protocols peer reviewed even before we start. So there's, there's some interesting initiatives that are coming out of the whole open idea of, of really shaking up research and, and how we can do it better. As long as that's being garbled, I feel like it was about can six in the morning. Can you tell us more about uh, Cochrane? Because, I mean, they're really, really awesome. And I'm not sure how many people outside of the UK know about the Cochrane uh, collaboration. People know about Cochrane? It's a, it's a global organisation. It's a, uh, within the field of medicine, it's started off in mm. about 1980s, this whole part of the evidence-based medicine field and agenda and informing medical decisions through sort of sharing uh, clinical information. Um, so their, their approach has always been a, not necessarily badged as open, but a, a community-based approach to doing research. Um, so the actual final review articles might be a pooling of all the data um, in your area. So they're already sort of using data yeah. in, in a way that's not just not badged as open. Um, so just to really wind that right back and just to say what they actually uh, do. So there's been 690 studies on, say, the effectiveness of uh, an India Pale Ale on uh, digestion. And each of those uh, studies have got a certain uh, number of participants. And it's impossible to sit there and read them all if you're just genuinely interested in forming opinions. So what Cochrane do is they get groups of academics, they agree the protocol that uh, they've mentioned, which is okay, how are we going to count if something is showing an effectiveness or a lack of effectiveness, how are we going to measure significance, how are we going to uh, look at uh, experimental designs that are good enough uh, to actually involve them. So they sit through there, they actually boost through all these studies and they make amazing findings that uh, actually save uh, people's uh, lives all over the world. But it's not possible to do uh, just from uh, one research group uh, doing one piece of research. Um, it's another way of answering the question as of uh, what do we do uh, with all this research, how can we use it? I'm sorry if that sounds <coughs> uh, really basic. I just thought I'd better uh, make sure everybody got that because I think it's a, a really mm -hmm. important point. On that idea of um, the amount of research, I remembered what I was um, going to say before. It's not a great point, actually. Great yeah, <laughs> probably build it up a little bit too much now. Um, but it was just actually that um, there's too much research going on in the sense that you can't yeah. keep up. It's too much stuff. And not only from the point of view of trying to digest it, but also trying to produce it. Um, whereas, you know, maybe it would be better if people just wrote two or three papers in their entire career, right? And then they were all good. Um, and that's all you've got to read. Um, I mean, it's not realistic because the pace of change is too great now. But if you go back maybe 100 years, maybe it was more like that. I don't know. Maybe there would be a study. You could do an interesting study around uh, publication um, rate frequency for um, over the history of the academy. Um, and in a way, it's the, it's the kind of industrialization of it almost. It's the churn it out, right? You've got to produce stuff all mm -hmm. the time. And you can't just keep producing research without the quality coming down, mm -hmm. right? Um, especially when you've got more and more pressure in terms of, you know, the finances behind it and getting funding and that kind of thing. Um, 
so so in a way those are those are other kind of pressures in a way which um, sort of muddy the waters around um, all that stuff um, but uh, on the to, to sorry Beck, did you want to say anything or did, did you want to anyone did you want to come in or I don't want to talk over you if you want to talk no, I was just I'll stop if you <laughs> <laughs> it was um, no I was just thinking about some of the stuff that came out of this and actually you know, exposing um, kind of projects and the way that they work through blogging and through kind of reflective activity and how useful that is. I know certainly for the, the hub and also for Law 14, you know, exposing the methodologies and sharing them with people and working with our, the collaborations that we've, we've worked with over the past few years, three years, that's been incredibly important to developing, um, developing the method um, and then sharing it back and blogging about it. I mean, it's certainly there's a time cost to this. Obviously, you know, what, what we've tried to do during the project is blog the results of research as it was coming out. So, you know, we kind of did a closer survey and then, you know, analyze the data and then publish the the, uh, the results of it ahead of time. Um, and there's a time cost to that. And for example, I know a um, colleague Bayer spent a lot of time preparing the data um, so we could release all of our data on Figshare as well. Um, and, you know, there was a cost, a cost to that. But I think it pays off. Um, and, um, yeah, so I was just kind of thinking about some of those. those kind of you could just explain what, mm. uh, Figshare and what uh, Figshare is, because that's a really uh, cool tool that uh, perhaps a lot of people haven't used. Okay. Has anyone heard of uh, Figshare? Mm. Oh, the vegetable card. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <laughs> a tool for sharing figs. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, that's uh, Figshare.com. Mm -hmm. um, if you've got um, a table that you've prepared for a paper, or a diagram, or a graph, or an image, or something like that, or a, um, a smallish collection of data. I don't think you can do massive data on Figshare. Okay. Uh, you just stick it up there. And now it's actually owned by one of the publishers, which you'd immediately think is like, Ooh. but um, it's actually all under an open license. And if you just want to put something somewhere to get something a bit uh, more exposure uh, it's a good place to think about mm. yeah definitely yeah we've had lots of feedback and people have reused the data or, or we've been kind of tinkering around with it yes yeah, so post posting it so we've got about seven and a half thousand survey responses from the work that we've done up there um, so, so maybe it's mm. maybe it's worth just saying a bit about how our research hub mm. sort of collected that survey data yeah. and got the workflow, if you like, because to start with, we had these kind of we, these hypotheses that were that guided the project. So things like OER use saves money, OER use improves student retention, OER use improves student grades. These kind of things. Mm -hmm. So these are the kind of things to shape the the project, if you like. So we use these to generate survey questions and interview questions and this kind of thing. So we've produced all these tools um, partly partly through consultation with our collaborators. Those tools themselves are on an open license, so anyone can take those tools, use them, adapt them, whatever. The data we got back in, um, we use SurveyMonkey to collect the data. The data we got back in has been cleaned and anonymized. We've used it to do our own research, but we've also put that data on Figshare for anyone to come along and use, um, actually to encourage them to use it, because we actually can't do all the possible analysis ourselves. We're three researchers and a professor. Um, and, you know, we've got... Even when that uh, professor is Martin Weller. Yeah. <laughs> well, it, we've only got 10%, but, you know, any other person, it would be like by having five professors. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I can see that. Um, so, so, so the idea is the whole process, right, um, and thinking about, you know, Martin had the scholarship model, four stages. The whole process for us, we've try, tried to say, right, what's the open version of that look like? So what does the open version of writing survey questions look like? Well, we, we do it publicly. We have consultations with people. We try to tinker it, uh, tinker with it in the open. Collecting the data. Well, we have these open collectors where, you know, anyone can come along and just add some data to it. We don't, there's, a, there's a price to pay there in terms of the methodology and the validity of some of it. But you can get around that and you can just say, well, look, this is what open research looks like. Mm. Um, there are different rules, maybe. Um, and through to, you know, dissemination, uh, you know, writing the papers, publishing open access, um, releasing the data on an open license, this kind of thing. So the idea is that every stage in the process, we've tried to explore 
what's the open version of this look like? So going back to some of the things we were talking about this morning, with, you know, this idea of openness as the subject of study as opposed to openness as the method of study. If you're doing open research into open educational resources, you're doing, you're doing the method and the subject. But those two things can be independent of each other. So, for instance, there's quite a lot of people in the GoGN network who are doing research into open stuff, MOOCs, whatever, using very traditional methods, um, and so on. So, um, uh, my general thought about the openness thing, I mean, obviously we've been exploring it as part of our, part of our work. I think it works pretty well um, in a number of ways. One way is it helps you build a bigger community, right? that you're trying to respond to in the first place, you're trying to connect with them in the first place, say, what should we be looking at? What's the most important thing to you? Um, they then become this network that's there throughout the project, right? You, you've got to pick people up. We've got several thousand people following us on social media. Um, and that starts to be your kind of, your open network. And that's your feedback loop. That's your place to disseminate, bounce ideas around. And when you do have a traditional output, like a journal publication, You've got an audience of people who are already interested. You can say, look, we're going to publish this now. Um, and, here's, and, and here's the kind of open access version of this thing that we've been working on for a while. So there is a kind of workflow there, but it, it's, and it works very well for us. I think we've been pretty productive and we've kind of, you know, um, we've been kind of true to what we set out to do. But then when you come into like back into the institutional um, structures in terms of what constitutes good research, then you come back into this, well, people don't do this normally. Um, if you say to the, you know, I was working with um, some of the legal people at the OU to um, get a contract signed off. And there was a, a long kind of discussion around who owned the IP on a project where, so it was a collaborative project. Uh, who owns the IP? We're gonna be releasing it on an open license, right? So the argument is only who owns the IP for that five minutes before it gets released on an open license. That was a massive issue for the lawyers, oh, wow. right? Because they don't have that in their register. Open what? Open licensing. Well, yeah, you can do that, but we still need to do everything the same way as before. So there's definitely a sort of inertia, an institutional inertia around this stuff. And it actually kind of makes you feel a bit like saying, yeah, let's sign up for the guerrilla research, right? <laughs> because I could spend six months sending emails to the legal team, or I could just go out and do stuff, and I don't need permission. But then along comes the thing, like as Viv says, then hang on a second, where are the rules? Where are the ethical kind of principles, norms, guidelines that you learn by being an institutional researcher? If someone just goes out and says, well, I can do it on my own, I don't, don't need to do that anymore. There's a lot more pressure on people in terms of you know, working in the open, because all of a sudden, the rules that you would have to follow aren't there anymore. So how do you become someone who's sort of well-versed enough in the, the language and the requirements and the needs of research ethics so that you can basically apply the same principles without having a kind of compliance model, which you get in most institutions. To get it signed off, you've got to show that you've done X, Y, Z, risk assessment, and so on. So that's just one example of the way that the, that the openness kind of changes the game really, from a research point of view, I would say. Uh, at this stage, I'd like, I'd love to hear what uh, Tanis has been up to, because, I mean, I mean you're the <laughs> only person here whose work I don't know, and I would love to hear about it. Ooh. And then also, I'd like to kind of start taking some uh, questions as well. So, well, uh, as I've been listening, I've been thinking, I, I think I quite, your idea of chimpanzee research really resonated. <laughs> with it's not really, you know, the big R research, um, and all the mechanics and um, industrial machine that goes with that. And it's not guerrilla either. And I think maybe it touches a little bit, you know, it still goes through an ethics review process. And that's the, the stuff I relate to most. I mean, I work at an applied institution. It's a small institution. And our research is applied research. So answers questions that are real and immediate to um, whoever we're working with. In the case of the research that we did on open, it really was that. It was sort of um, answering questions that we had about how did we get to open? Why, why, as a closed institution, do we have so many open education resources now that are being used and adopted and adapted? And what contributed to that? Was it money? Was it funding? Was it people? 
So for me, that, that really addresses that space. And I've been in education, you know, for a long time. And I don't think I've ever had a research project that's ever been funded. So some of these mm -hmm. mechanics and the, the, the industrial machine that goes with that gives you freedom to actually, if you can, do small R research. And that's actually what we call it at our institution, is small R research. Because I think what happens is, you know, the big R research and the papers and the publication and these concerns that a lot of people have and are trying to push back on from the open community is really, um, you know, it's a result in some ways of addressing funders and having a profile and an image that's associated with, you know, where the money was spent. And I think, um, you know, that's wonderful, but it's also problematic. So the smaller research kind of gets at a different layer. And um, if you're willing to work with projects that aren't resource intensive and, um, you know, you can, you can do on your own institutional time. But I think there's a lot of that that people do that you don't really see or hear about. And I think in the open education research world, I think that's a real opportunity, actually, that um, I'm not seeing or hearing a lot about. But it's quite, it's not unfamiliar to people in an applied institution. I love that idea of small R of research. That's really powerful. I shall keep that in mind. <laughs> it's uh, not like it takes 10 years off and related to getting big R research. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Exactly, so yeah. If you're going to get yeah. 10 years, you've got to have big R. Sorry. Um, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, it's all those chairs. Um, you can research that in Carly. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Draw a line draw. Um, we've uh, covered a lot of ground. There's uh, lots of directions we could go at this point. I think we don't like to respond to uh, you guys and let uh, uh, you uh, talk to us about uh, some of the things that have been raised. And hopefully, the next little chunk will be more targeted to the kind of things that you picked up. So, is, is there any questions or comments or responses? Yes, Alan. Is there some equivalent for the big share for data? I mean, there used to be some medical stuff that was, I think it was biomedicine that was collecting yeah. unused research data. I mean, the, if the figures are good, but yeah. there's not much you can do with the figures. Besides I mean, there's lots of, uh, there's a whole uh, world out there of research data. Uh, Art data. Repositories. Um, and this is uh, Bugs for Research, which is uh, research data which is not actually going to be used, and research data that has been used is uh, linked back to the uh, kind of reproducibility of science. Uh, so a lot of institutions, especially if they're um, intensive research uh, focused institutions, will likely have an open data repository. A lot of subject areas, subject uh, communities will have an open data research open data uh, repository. You sometimes see it in journals. You sometimes see that uh, they do this as well, or in uh, learned societies. It's also equally possible to do it yourself. I mean, the uh, stuff I presented at OpenEd uh, 15, which was almost about the uh, history of the conference itself, it was very meta, um, which I kind of like. All of the uh, data which uh, me and Alan uh, discovered about that, that's all on a, a Google Sheet, that's all on the license. So next time somebody else wants to do something like that, they don't need to go through the two weeks of uh, pain that myself and Alan had to go through to, to actually get all that uh, together. So yeah, there's lots of places for research data sets. There's a, a lot of issues linked to the storage and retrieval of research data that I could talk to more about, but I'll uh, take some more questions. But I mean, just, I mean, I mean, on the scale of like medical and human genome, I mean, education data is pretty small. I mean, that's the critique of a lot of studies is that the sample mm -hmm. size isn't enough. And, I mean, yeah, it's going to be great when individuals make these efforts, but yeah, it's going to be so scattered. It's so scattered. If you look at somebody like uh, Coursera, they've got mm -hmm. a load of student uh, data and they release bits of it to the institutions that they work with. Uh, Coursera is one of the big MOOC uh, platforms uh, globally. They uh, work with the top institutions all over the world. 
Uh, MOOCs were a kind of open course that were fashionable back in 2012. <laughs> <laughs> probably a bit historical for a lot of people now. But I mean, they have a lot of student data which they just keep hold of because they see it as a part of uh, their value. But there's a whole other digression about the uh, value of user activity data as well, but I'm not going to go there right now. It's more comments. Mm -hmm. Audrey Waters' line, student data is the new oil. Yes, <laughs> yes. So. Um, I'll briefly mention the Center for Open Science is a great uh, place for people to look at. Uh, yeah. It encourages the sharing of pre-registration of hypotheses, sharing of data, research mm -hmm. materials, um, pre-publication, post-publication. So that's great. But I'm really interested in how, in the factors that foster or inhibit the shift towards open research practices. Um, so, for example, you talked about the re reproducibility uh, crisis and psychology of disciplines, one, of the, one yeah. of the disciplines that's been grappling with this. And to me, it's great that that, that that has been the impetus for people to shift to open, as opposed to social justice and some of the other arguments that we make about the public should be able to access research. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, I see many points of tension. Um, you have some leading journals that have adopted uh, digital badges for open research practices that foster that, uh, which is great. But you see, as I mentioned to, to Vivian earlier, that early career researchers, for example, have difficulty uh, publishing open access um, in journals because they have least access to like, uh, funding for APCs. Um, mm. Or there are people who have emerging concerns about the sharing of data because other researchers might uh, dig in, mine, and publish something based on it that they may perhaps didn't get to. So, I mean, uh, these are things that can be dealt with in, in a variety yeah. of ways, but I'm interested in, in how the fostering can occur more and how we manage, how we can navigate these sorts of obstructions. Um, there's a lot of questions in there. I yeah. want to pass on to the rest of the panel. <laughs> I want to mention quickly before I do that uh, the APC's article uh, processing costs, that's the uh, payment a researcher or institution would make to a journal for open publication. That's not the only model of open publication. It's not even the only model of open journal. It's obviously been the more, um, actually one of the more popular with uh, publishers uh, because they like to get paid. And if they're not going to get paid by libraries subscribing, they want to get paid by people submitting papers because obviously academic publishers add a lot of value to the work of academics in uh, researching, uh, writing, reviewing, moderating, uh, typesetting, <laughs> and otherwise mangling uh, <coughs> research outputs to make them into data. I think that the mm -hmm. uh, journal publishers like choose the cover on the front or something, I'm not sure, something like that anyway. Um, Sorry, I'll pass one. I'm back. We're digressing a lot here. <laughs> what was the question again? <laughs> <laughs> it seemed a long time ago. The, uh, how do you foster the shift when there are, Sorry. Um, there are several real barriers? And I think uh, the leaders in the discipline um, sometimes can, mm. but often won't foster that, that shift. Um, so, for example, we talked about tenure earlier. Mm. And it is often the case that the more prestigious journals are the ones that require APCs, mm -hmm. and the less prestigious, prestigious journals are the ones that are truly open. So, so the question is, whence prestige, right? Where's it coming from? Mm. Who's affording uh -huh. this prestige? Mm -hmm. um, the journals only claim it on the basis of the editorial boards and things like that. Um, but, <laughs> you know, half the time, if you've ever worked on a journal, Half the time, the people whose name are in the front cover as the editorial board have literally nothing to do with the journal at all, ever. They are just figureheads in front of the, you know, in front of the thing. That's it. Um, and the, the question is, well, why? Well, it's, you know, it's, it's prestige for them, I suppose, to, to be considered worthy of, you know, being an, a, a totem towards academic rigor or something. Um, but... At some level, it's just, you know, it's not really benefiting anybody to keep buying into this thing. But mm -hmm. it only perpetuates because people buy into it. Um, and it's, it's, it's quite telling, I think, with the, um, with, you know, the, the actual the kind of the vehemency which, with, with which academic publishers have fought against open access. 
it's unbelievable how coordinated they are, how much money they pump into it. Mm. Um, the stuff, for, and, and in a way, this is why. I mean, I, I, I've like so over the over the Open Education Conference last week. I was, you know, I was kind of noticing that there's a, there's a sort of emerging this this kind of um, this wing, if you like, of the open education movement, which is kind of focused on open textbook adoption. And so you get the studies done by David Wiley, John Hilton, and, and, and this kind of group of people. Efficacy studies um, and, and cost savings and very kind of focused in on um, adoption of open textbooks. And you can see why that's the strategy, because um, especially in the USA, this is a massive area where they can have a big impact um, and a tangible impact. So you can see why um, you know, there's an inroad against the, a, a sort of counterpoint to the power that academic publishers have. Um, I do think it's important for, the, for, that to, for that to happen. The danger is that it ends up being nothing more than trying to replace the existing system, almost replicate it or colonize it from within. But now it's got an open license on it, and it's like, well, that's okay then. Yeah, we've mm -hmm. done our job. And I don't think that's the full story with open education. I think there's a danger of losing sight of the wider sort of idea. I, I hesitate to use the word disruption in its full glory, but the idea that... Um, there's some fundamental change to education systems that can be afforded by basically the, the internet and, wow. and widespread digital technologies that allow you to replicate information anywhere in the world at, at marginal, marginal costs. Um, so uh, I thought there was a, a good, I forget who said it at the conference now, um, I think it was attributed to Stephen Downs, but it's like give people permissions, not requirements, right? Mm -hmm. Empower people and kind of make it possible to do more things. Mm -hmm. um, because the systems that we have in, in education and, and, and research, they're based on good principles and good observations about how to do education. But we're in danger of reifying them and kind of just making them into, all well, this is it now. This is what education has to look like. Um, and I'm increasingly interested in the more kind of like, um, I suppose it's the kind of edupunk end of the spectrum, right? The kind of do-it-yourself end of the spectrum. Um, and partly that's because I think institutions almost need to be pulled in that, in that direction themselves, right? They, that needs to be a kind of center of gravity to make people think, actually, what can you do with technology now? What can you do if you, if you adopt open practices? What does it look like? How does it change? That kind of thing. Hmm. Do we want to talk about uh, journal impact factors, or are we just going to lose that one? I kind of had a question that kind of related to that. Which is your question? <laughs> when, you know, listening to the overall tenor, pretty much from every panelist, the so-called big R research, I'm at a loss to pick out any statements that were positive or affirmative, um, <laughs> other than it maybe helps pay for some people's livelihoods a little bit, mm -hmm. um, and that's about it. I mean, I I can't recall uh, any other statement. Like pretty much everything that came out here was that, that either small L research or the kind of Quasi research that happens in the in the informal spaces is and it's it aligns. I mean, maybe that's what I'm hearing because it aligns with my own experience. I've been part of a couple official journal publications, and it was just it was horrible. It took <laughs> years to get through. We were restricted in what we could do. We were restricted in how we could do it, and mm -hmm. and and then the the time lag between publication and the, the revision process, which struck me as nonsensical at the time. As opposed, and, and nobody has, and this is where, the, where it speaks to impact. The only time I ever had anyone like give me any indication, I'm definitely in that not point eight thing, was somebody stumbled across a reference to it while they were searching for something else and thought it was funny and posted it on Twitter. That's the only <laughs> response I ever got to that article. And whereas, you know, you can write a blog post and you, you get five comments, you know, even just a regular post, you know, that night from smart people that push back on things. And it's not just, a way to go, like a lot of it's critical, and mm -hmm. have you thought about this, or I don't think you're thinking about that. So I just want, I guess, to lead to a question, um, you know, are there any cracks in the ferment of this idea of impact? Because I guess that's the one thing they have, is this idea of legitimacy. It, in the practical sense, I know all of you are practicing small L research and benefiting from it, and the networking and digital scholarship and all that, because that's why you're here. But I wrote to it. Is 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 that big R research? Is is that still as impermeable as it 
so it seems. I think education information will always be small R research. Mm -hmm. You know, it has no lever in my organisation mm -hmm. at all. I mean, with, in the UK, we have units of assessment that our research is measured every five or six years in a process, and institutions get their research funding and they've just closed down their education research and assessment. But I, th I think there are cracks because I think um, the whole sort of big science, big engineering research impact agenda has so now been demonstrated not to be making the advances that it should or be so problematic and full of bias and gender bias that now people are actually mm -hmm. fighting back against our metrics and our sort of impact agenda in the UK and I think some people might even choose to opt out of the next big assessment because of that so I think there's a bit of a pushback in the UK I don't know about other countries so yeah I think yeah. in general, open education, um, a very uh, brief point, there's not actually any money in uh, research, really. There's uh, a little bit of money in evaluation and the fine work of my colleagues at uh, Leo, clearly our hub and others um, are doing some great stuff with that. In terms of uh, critical education research, um, there's next to no money in critical education research. There's uh, some people uh, want uh, quantitative stuff, stat stuff, uh, quasi-scientific double-blind trials that aren't really by trials like Canison, but it's simply a function of funding. I don't think anybody along this uh, panel uh, publishing critical worthwhile education research is not our full-time job, is it? Mm -hmm. no. Nobody has that job. It's mm -hmm. not a job that even exists anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, Tannis, you were going to come in there, sorry. Yeah, well, I was getting, I'm just thinking about, like, again, Viv, because, I don't know, I think we seem to understand each other, but the, the who is doing the research part is, again, like, I'm not against big R research, I think you need it, but... Mm. There's also this neglected area of people. So, for example, in the colleges and institutes, for the most part, we don't have tenure, which means, you know, we're not bound by that, you know, I have to publish an XYZ journal. We have, like, we can publish in open journals, and it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if the journal doesn't have this great impact factor or whatever. Like, we have an opportunity as smaller researchers to not play in that system in some ways when we don't have to chase the tenure and the portfolio. So there are opportunities, and I guess we're not funded anyways. I mean, even the big art education research isn't funded anyways. So mm -hmm. where are the opportunities in our jobs and in our institutions and structures that we have to contribute? Because I do think it's important. I, I mean, I don't, I mean, it is, it is on the one hand very negative. And, mm -hmm. But I mean, there's a, there is a piece of this that is getting back our agency too, which is sort of a big thing of mine. You know, where's our institutional agency to push, you know, these journals. I mean, it's just crazy. How do we give that away? Like, how did we give away this free labor to these journals and to these publishing houses and uncritically? I just don't know how we got here, you know? If you think about, you know, as you, as, as you go through kind of graduate school, um, I mean, Beck and I trained as um, philosophers um, in the same institution. What we were always told was, you know, the idea of an open access publication You'd have to be out of your mind, you know. <laughs> as far as as far as the faculty were concerned, why would you ever do that? Why would you ever give away your work for free? Only publish your best work and only in the best journals. That's it. And there's no there's no discussion after that. Um, but obviously, it's a bit of a meat grinder getting trying to get an academic job, and so people will just do anything, you know. Um, and it's like, well, if you only publish in in these journals, okay then. You know, and I'll, I'll go and live in my garret for a few years and, you know, eat, eat beans out of a tin and just kind of try and do that. Um, and that's considered to be perfectly acceptable, that conformity. So what I'd say in answer to your point about why, how do we do this, it's not a coincidence, right? There are massive power structures operating mm -hmm. to make sure that people conform to the existing way of doing things. Mm -hmm. It's strategic. Um, and if you're really cynical and a critical theorist, like some people are, you might say... Well, this is a way of sort of actually silencing free expression and free, free thought, you know, controlling the way that people engage with ideas and share them and communicate about them. Um, and one, one, side, one side effect of um, pushing your ideas into an academic uh, f 
format is that you make them pretty much unreadable for 90% of people. Mm. Yeah. Exactly. So. Yeah. Like and call that. it impact. Yeah. yeah. But there's almost, I mean, frankly, it almost mm -hmm. feels like we aspire to play in this game that we can't mm -hmm. play in. So, terrible metaphor, but I always sneer at the people in first class mm. on the plane. And then I started getting upgrades, and I was like, <laughs> this isn't bad. <laughs> yeah. it's a um, but then I felt sleazy. Yeah. And then you go on an airline like Southwest, the first class doesn't exist. Yeah. And they have fun. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I, I know all this stuff is just, that, that's a little bit playful. And, and it is very stacked against uh, mm -hmm. people doing that. But, you know, you could try to play your game. It sounds like you're just going to, like, kill yourself trying to crack that. Mm -hmm. uh, but I don't know what the alternative is. It just occurs to me that, I mean, open education is maybe the uh, first example of a, a field of inquiry that has uh, grown in the social sciences since the internet became mainstream. And what I think is notable about it, I've been sitting here trying to think of a notable, like, open education uh, journal paper that, I mean, we mm -hmm. would all point to and say, Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a classic. I mean, I could mm -hmm. point to tons of David Wiley uh, blog posts mm -hmm. or Scott Leslie videos or uh, Paul Stacey or all of these people, but all of the uh, literature is in the open. It's on blogs. All of the mm -hmm. canon mm -hmm. of open education is on blogs, and it's a job for somebody sometimes mm -hmm. to actually archive these things and keep them and put them somewhere so we don't lose them. But um, I think that this is the first field where that has happened. Yeah. Except for those open articles that are in closed journals. <laughs> uh, which all of us read and cite regularly. <laughs> <laughs> That's true, it links to what the lady in the shirt said there before about, uh, you know, publication is, is the currency, isn't it? It's what mm. we sort of promote our sort of academic colleagues and staff by. And, I think you were bang on there. It's how do we influence that at that level to then consider all these other things and then light years away from that. But I think that would be a really interesting project for some HR department. I think it still comes back to curriculum development and embedding this in our courses. You know, I mean, yeah. if, you, if this is an area that excites a young faculty member coming into our faculty and they end up being successful in a tenure track position, and then we see them teaching something like one of our new courses. We just created a new course, which is cross a multidisciplinary between journalism, communications, sociology, and psychology called Digital Communities. And it's our first blended mm -hmm. course, which means that it'll be somewhat face-to-face -face and somewhat online. And it, it's going to expect students to engage in that online world. And the assignments will all be in, embedded in there just exciting conversation Brian and I were just having about this create my domain domain, idea, of, one's domain of one's own you know which I could see really working in a course like this you know yeah. if you start I mean that's a kernel of change mm -hmm. right that's a small thing in our faculty it'd be a it would be something that would be dramatically different but then you broaden that out to that faculty member now becoming tenured and now becoming perhaps the chair of a department and maybe someday replacing me as a dean you know, that's how change happens, you know, because then that person like me will be sitting as chair of the promotion and tenure mm -hmm. committee looking at questions of, you know, we look at questions of originality, of credibility, of legitimacy, of widening sphere of influence in your field of study. And now we're going to say, well, you know, let's broaden that definition. Yeah. And, you know, so yeah. eventually those small changes can, can make big changes. You know, I don't think it might happen during my mm -hmm. tenure. I'll probably tired before that happens, but at least, you know, you can see glimmers of hope in, in the, new, the new world, if you like, with the younger faculty coming forward. And I mean, we're, we're in our faculty right now in a, in a very, uh, you know, moment of change because we're going through a very dramatic um, curriculum review. And uh, it's, it's going to change, realign all of our programs. And I, it was interesting that I don't forget, remember your name, but you were talking about how instead of looking at program requirements, look at program permissions. In other words, what, what do we say to our students? What can you do? Mm -hmm. We're all about what you can't do. You have to do this, you have to do that. You have two credits, four credits of this, and six credits of this. And we, we set up these barriers and these blocks and these boxes for students to fit into, to conform to. 
Well, but the new, the generations coming out of high school right now, they're all about e-portfolios. They've dramatically changed the high school curriculum in BC mm. over the last five years, and and what the students are presenting are e-portfolios, and they're very cross-pollinated with, you know, I'm going to look at homelessness, but I'm going to look at it from literature, from psychology, from sociology. From, I'm going to go on the street and interview people, and then they're bringing all. I mean, students themselves coming into our classrooms are always doing it. You know, so. I mean, I, I feel, I mean, I also, I feel the tension. I obviously live with that tension in my, in my job, but I also feel somewhat optimistic. I think just to that, I'd add, it's not just the students under those forces, it's also the staff, right? Oh, absolutely. Rather than being told, well, what can, you know, asked what can you do? It's you must do this, you must conform in these various ways, and, and so on. Um, and... Just to try and sort of link that with the idea of openness. To me, the idea of openness is sort of in, in, intimately connected with a certain idea of freedom, possibility. And my working definition of openness that I'm kind of experimenting with at the moment is this idea of when you say that something is open, you really is just another way of saying that there's some restriction has been removed, right? So I can't access an article, well, now you've got open access, so that barrier has gone, and so on. Um, and so I want to I want to sort of connect it with a kind of normative idea of freedom in some way, um, and then this is this is partly where my interest in the sort of edgy punk stuff comes from because it's like, what does it look like to be empowered by openness, right? Does it mean I've now got a cheap textbook, or does it mean I'm engaging with this stuff in a new way and I see myself in a in a changed way, as a practitioner? Um, and I think that that is an important thing for open research in terms of like this sort of idea of identity that's been discussed already. And I think that comes through in some of the research that's coming out of the stuff that we've done on open textbooks in the project as well. So I've done a lot of work with, um, in this side of stuff as part of the hub work and in some um, the work I've been doing with open tax um, in particular. Um, it's clear that people, you know, um, the impact that having an open textbook has on what people choose to do with their, their, their courses and how they can now feel less constrained um, to just use one resource, um, less partly maybe because students you know, would ask why are you getting to use a really costly textbook if you're you know, introducing them instead of, people will kind of quote some kind of feedback we were getting from people with things like, oh, I feel like almost less guilty. There's a kind of removal of this guilt by using this, this kind of resource. This resource enables me to kind of mix things up and um, come out of our other research as well. The fact that OER is kind of um, enables um, educators to respond better to the learners in their class, the diverse learners' needs, and, and so on. It's kind of, um, we've seen kind of more educators saying that they use um, OER. I think we do at recent OpenStax work of around three quarters of the educators we survey said they were more likely to use other OER as a result of using something like OpenStax. So you kind of see this like opening um, up of, of in, in not everybody, obviously some people would kind of say, well, actually, no, this didn't change my practice at all. But the work that we've done um, on Around. We've got a hypothesis to do with um, OER, um, uh, to do with critical reflection, educators and critical reflection and kind of changes in practice. I think there's some really interesting kind of stuff that comes out of there and it's not really been explored very much other than, as far as I'm aware, the work that we've been kind of doing. So, yeah. More questions? Thoughts? I just thought we have uh, 10 minutes left, we should do uh, one of those questions where everybody in the panel uh, gives like an opinion or a piece of advice, um, because I always like them at the end of the panel, so yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. the panel, they kind of round things off. So unless anybody's got a better one, I'd like to propose what advice would you give to somebody that was considering entering open research, either as a practice or as a, um, a field of inquiry? Am I getting any uh, uh, yeah, uh, pushback on that big words question you've ever heard? Yeah. Maybe you can, can tweak it slightly, starting... Starting your academic career. Which path would you go on, knowing what you know now? With open research. Oh, with open research. Uh, oh, next one. Uh, where should we start? We should start one at the end, shouldn't we? <laughs> <laughs> Does that mean starting the other end? Let's start the middle. It's difficult, isn't it? So 
I started off as a scientist, so I couldn't have chosen this route. So I would have had to have gone the big art route, and well, that's why I fell over and moved camps. So, yeah, as a scientist, as I said, you need to be an engineer or whatever, and then these subjects have a choice. Um, so my advice would be start blogging. I mean, that, that so transformed my work and my thinking and writing. I would, I would, I'd echo that about blogging. I think it is useful. I would say Twitter has been a very useful tool for me. Um, yeah. And not just, I mean, partly also, I mean, I never trained in ed tech. Um, I am almost finished um, a master's degree in, in online and distance education. That I've been doing kind of fairly casually on the side while I've been working at the OU. But my, my baptism into this stuff, if you like, was on the job, right? So, um, and, you know, when I started at the Open University, I, uh, I was just finishing my PhD. So um, I trained to be a philosopher, <clears throat> and um, the world's a bit unforgiving for, for uh, wannabe philosophers, and if you noticed. Um, <laughs> so, you, you know, there's only one way into philosophy, and that's play the game, right? That's the publication game. That's, that's the, the only way to get into it. Um, I, I started to realize, once I was working in ed tech, that it was a much better funded subject. Um, there's always new money available for ed tech, and there's always education budgets, um, and so I started to realize, and also the other element to it was, I realized that there weren't so many philosophers doing work in that field. So there was a gap, right, that I could move into. But the question is, how do you then move into it? I found Twitter really useful in, in a number of ways. One was, it let me start to just build a network of the right people, right, and see what are they talking about? What's happening out there in the open that I can kind of just start to pick up on? Um, also, it let me kind of project um, a professional identity. Um, by the kind of stuff that I would retweet or that I would put out there and gave me a kind of feedback mechanism to start saying, well, okay, what's out there? Now, if you compare that to the, the typical model, most um, early career uh, academics will be teaching a lot. They might publish one or two papers a year and, then, and most of those will just languish unread somewhere, you know, unless you're very good or very lucky. So um, already, that, you know, I started to have this alternative way of doing things that proceeded for me sort of knowledge of the subject area, actually. So I started exploring the open technologies first, and that gave me a way to learn more about the practices. Um, so I would say, you know, you have to be kind of prepared to get your hands dirty and be a technologist, actually, um, and sort of start using these things. What happens if you publish something on an open license on a blog? There's only one way to find out, right? It's just to do it. Um, so I would say it's about not being afraid of experimentation, um, and kind of being sort of open-minded, I suppose, about where it might lead. Um, and then you'll find out whether it has value for you uh, as a researcher and, and, you know, it will help you to orientate yourself around open research, I, I would say. Yeah, I think experimenting um, with different tools and kind of different processes. I was kind of thinking, I mean, blogging and Twitter has been um, really important um, for me project and personally as well, kind of building up and, uh, an understanding of communities and so on. I would also say that like something that I found, uh, we found a community project very beneficial was um, community review processes. Um, so we wrote a course about open research, so, um, which is on peer-to-peer -peer university. Um, and as part of the process of creating this course, it was open for community review. So anyone could come and kind of comment on the course. and partly work on a project to do with um, opening educational practices in Scotland and um, that course is currently open for community review and actually kind of ties back to what we were saying earlier about kind of blogging and talking about the way that you're doing things and opening yourself up, um, opening up the processes and the way that you're doing things for people to come and comment. Like you were saying, why you publish a blog post and have loads of people kind of come in and, and, and give feedback and, and the way that that improves the, the, the way that you work and things like that is incredibly kind of beneficial. Your question answered. <laughs> <laughs> I don't feel qualified to give any advice. I mean, for me, I guess where where I, I get interested is in the spaces where there's not a lot of chatter, and like I'm really interested in this the alternative tertiary education institutes, like the institutes, colleges, vocationals, mm -hmm. and I, I just want I want to hear more about that. I guess I guess that would be a space where, you know, if I was starting. I mean, I'm in that, obviously, but, you know, I just feel like there's so much um, opportunity to look in those areas of 
OER topics yeah. and research. And lots of partners, probably, too. Commonwealth of Learning does a lot there, and you know, there's, yeah. I don't know if that's advice. It's more like maybe it's just wishful thinking desire. <laughs> that's what I would want to do. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think I'm actually absolved from answering this question. I'm not an academic. <laughs> um, I don't have a master's degree. I don't have a PhD. I've never had any kind of uh, research role actually in a role I've been paid to do. Yet somehow here I am having attended an academic conference in Canada and I'm now on a panel of uh, researchers talking the about panel research. <laughs> <laughs> am I sharing with the uh, panel now? Sharing it, it just looks that way. Yeah. <laughs> Do I get paid more for that? <laughs> yeah, you can double. I'll double it. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. awesome. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, with those caveats, I think any advice I could offer is almost worthless. Uh, <laughs> but I'm going to offer some anyway because this is the way we do things in academia. Um, the most interesting bits of research for me are things that happen in the fringes between lots of different uh, disciplines. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think actually EdTech is now a, um, a discipline, and I think that's the uh, reason that we've seen a number of high-profile uh, defections <laughs> from EdTech as a, a field mm -hmm. of inquiry. The most interesting stuff was always to me on the boundaries uh, between numbers of things. Um, I'm fascinated by uh, policy making, innovation ideas. Uh, I've got a big thing for economics at the moment. Um, and it's just bringing two things together. That's where the excitement is, that's where new fields and new ideas are uh, uh, more quickly uh, generate, um, mm -hmm. generated. That's the reason open education has been such an exciting field over the past 10 years or so, and will probably continue to be for a fair bit longer. But, and it's also, I, I guess, if you're that kind of person, uh, a place where a reputation can be made, that if you, want to be seen as somebody adding to uh, knowledge, adding to understanding of the world around us, being on the fringes of uh, numerous fields of inquiry, it's probably easier. And the, the, uh, you'd have uh, more freedom to experiment with method publications, with um, frames of reference with different authorial voices, that kind of thing. But on the downside, there'd be no money in that whatsoever. So if you like eating, I recommend you go and do, uh, there's a, a lot of money in uh, particle uh, physics at the moment, uh, certain parts of medicine, if you find an illness that kills lots of rich white guys, I <laughs> uh, should probably research that. There's tons of money in that. Get into um, gout or something. Or, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Gout is going to be huge over the next few years. Or you can put a lot of money in gout. Or that's another thing you can do, which is a fascinating field of inquiry in, its, in itself, I think. So, yeah, that's what I'd offer. With that, uh, thanks to the panel. Housekeeping notes. Um, tomorrow morning.